And here we go. We are live on the very first podcast with Apollo Scooters. I'm your host, Sean. And with me are the two co-founders of Apollo, Chris and Match, and our CTO, Mr. Elwa. Welcome, everybody. Thanks for having, Thanks for having us. us. Well, thank you for having me. <laughs> um, so I guess today we want to start off with the story of Apollo, how we started, or how you guys started, and maybe the story behind Apollo and, and uh, why the name Apollo. Sure. Yeah, all good questions. Uh, to be honest, we, we started two and a half years ago now, three years ago. And uh, to be honest, there was not much of a business uh, kind of story behind it. You, you hear a lot of businesses starting with research, business plans, getting investors, and you know it's a very intentional process. We stumble into ours, and uh, to be honest, what, what, what happened is we ordered 10 scooters of Alibaba. Uh, we, we tried to buy them ourselves in Canada locally. We were unable to find any, and we figured if we buy 10, sell 8, they'll pay for the two we want to keep for ourselves. That was really the extent of our business kind of thinking at the time. Uh, but before we knew it, uh, we put up a couple ads on Facebook Marketplace, Kijiji, Craigslist, and we woke up to something like 45, 50 messages the next morning. So clearly there was just an overwhelming amount of demand for, for these products and mm -hmm. we had no idea that it existed. So we figured why not make the, te the, you know, the 10 units we originally ordered 20 and then eventually became 40 and then became 80 and it kind of went up from there. Um, and you know, the very first thing we did as soon as we, we realized that scooters are our products that break was get in touch with Elwa. Um, <laughs> and we also met um, in, a, in a very strange way, and that's a separate story. But um, yeah, the three of us have been, have been at it ever since. And you know, now it's two and a half years later, and uh, we have a company. So. And, and a podcast. Um, yeah, yeah. a podcast. <laughs> and to add on to that, so, so the name of Polo was, again, we were just looking to get two scooters for us. And we realized if we wanted to buy 10 and actually sell them, we had to incorporate a company in Quebec. Um, so when incorporating the company, we're like, okay, what are we going to name it? And Match has a beautiful little Boston Terrier called Apollo. And Apollo just runs up and he was playing at the same time. We're like, yeah, let's just name it Apollo Imports. And, <laughs> and yeah, today it's, it's known as Apollo. And lots of people think, ooh, Apollo, the electric scooter company, it's uh, you know, named after the god of speed and light. And stuff as well. and I'm like, yeah, whatever, whatever you want to phrase it. But it's actually based off of a dog. Which, yeah. And what a cute dog it is. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, so how did you guys meet then? Like all three of you, I guess. Yeah, well, uh, Chris and I, we just met in school, nothing crazy. We ended up working at, uh, at L'Oreal for a bit after, and we were mm -hmm. both looking for an escape, so that brought us together, I guess. <laughs> um, but yeah, the, the story of how we met a lot was, was really, I think, something that's, that's a bit more special. We, we were in, uh, I think it was like June or, or July of 2018, we received samples of these scooters that at the time seemed incredible to us, and the only place we could think to, to test them was the F1 track here in Montreal. So we ventured out there and you know brought these scooters with us and before we knew it we stumbled into two guys on electric skateboards and you know they had electric products we had electric products we figured hey let's let's stop and have a conversation and uh, one of those two guys was Elwa who uh, who tried one of our scooters and fell in love and hasn't touched an electric skateboard since so, <laughs> no I'm just kidding but, the rest um, of history <laughs> yeah um, yeah no fast forward through many many repairs Elwa's second bedroom becoming essentially the the Apollo repair warehouse oh boy. Um, yeah, his girlfriend yeah. was not happy. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was laundry on the left side and scooters on the right side. <laughs> so, no, we, we essentially just uh, decided that we we had more than you know a full time uh, kind of full time works amount of work for Elwa and and mm -hmm. we brought him on as soon as we could and, and he's been with us with us ever since. Wow. Yeah. So you guys got started in your apartments, right? Yeah. <laughs> tell me, tell me about those uh, early stages. Elwa. Yeah. Uh, yeah, the first office was in uh, Chris' apartment. Uh, it was nice for me because we were <laughs> close to like the the metro and like it was re really easy to get to. Um, I think uh, it was a perfect office to really bond uh, us together. We're so close. Uh, to give you an idea, we couldn't stand up two at the same time. What was your desk like, Elwa? <laughs> My desk was a foldable one uh, on the wall uh, in front of uh, Chris' closet. So. When he wanted to pick up clothing, well, I had to fold my desk. Uh, yeah, uh, it was nice, but uh, yeah, we needed more space. And uh, in my apartment, uh, a room. Maybe we can put a, a picture uh, for the the video. But uh, the room was full of scooters. At one point, there was twelve scooters, uh, and we couldn't walk. But uh, it was pretty fun, and I was used to it with electric skateboards. So it was great. It was great. Yeah, but so, and also just for context. When starting, like we did everything in the business as we went step by step, and it was always based on how can we save the most costs and grow 
big. I mean, and we, we were always very careful. So when we started, we started in apartments until we really grew out that space. And when I say grew out that space, it means like we could not walk anymore. And like we then hired, um, we then got a locker downstairs in the apartment building where we stuffed, you know, 10 scooters and then we got 20 and 30 and then we took two lockers, three lockers. Um, and it got to a point where every day Canada Post would come to the apartment building, which is a condo residence, and we would have to like lug um, a scooter up three floors, uh, bring it there, and then the building got furious because there was yeah. 20 scooters every day and we, <laughs> we broke lots of things. Anyway, the building was very nice and I'd say even though I was doing repairs in the basement, which was honestly at a corridor of like 30 centimeters to get through and it was not the best environment, but then again, we were still working um, on ours after L'Oreal, I guess. But again, we just maximized the space until we finally could afford and actually move into a bigger, bigger place. Oh, wow. But I think I think particularly what we're grateful for is those early early customers that came to the lobby of this condo building, convinced it was the lobby <laughs> of an office, and we relentlessly told them that that it is an office, and in fact, our office is upstairs. We just you know we we prefer meeting customers in the lobby. Um, and they, yeah, for whatever reason, they still bought scooters from us despite testing them on the side of the street um, in a condo building. So. And it probably a lot of questions when someone hands you $1,500 yeah. in cash <laughs> in a side alleyway. We're like, oh. <laughs> but anyway, it was, uh, it was early adopters, so it was nice. That's impressive. Yeah, if I was showing up to some apartment building to buy a scooter that was, uh, you know, trying yeah. to convince me it was yeah. legit, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I think within six months, they got little uh, signs on the doors that had like a big scooter across the house. <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah. yeah, did you did your guys like landlord uh, the yeah. building managers allow you to do this or did they even know? No, so I mean it wasn't allowed. You're not supposed to use residential as commercial, and we got uh, warnings. But they were lovely. They were really nice. So we we gave the context of it, and we we're like, honestly, we're out here in six months. We're just running a business here, and we're growing and whatever. And um, they were very nice. Like could have mm. been worse. Yeah. Interesting. So what were you guys' first scooters that you purchased? Oof. The, the Xiaomi. I guess the, the Xiaomi copies. Yeah, the Xiaomi copy the, the first ten units. And after that I think it was with the Evolve, if I'm correct. Some Arcanes, I think, in there too. Arcane, yeah. yeah. The, the first one I tried was the Evolve Pro. Yeah. Uh, it's the, the the it's equal to the Apollo Pro but not as good. <laughs> but uh, and I remember the feeling of like to give you an idea, I had a pretty powerful electric skateboard and I thought it was cool until I tried the, the the evil and I was like wow like that's something completely new I only tried the lime before that and um, I was like wow I have no idea a scooter could be as powerful as this yeah and now looking back on the scooters <laughs> yeah, uh, not as powerful it was 52 volt 23 AH or maybe 18 AH in that time the base model um, it's nothing compared to like the Ludo or the 16 nah. AH for sure and, and the reality is like when, we st when you start looking for scooters and you have no idea what scooters are the best it's like we were talking to all these suppliers on Ali, Alibaba and everything, and we wanted to get original Xiaomi's in the start, and then they were like, no, but the fake, the fake copy Xiaomi's are exactly the same quality, amazing, and it's like $100 cheaper, so we're like, of course we're going to buy the fake ones, I can get $100 more in profit. Um, and then like, the first time we got our, our shipment, we were so excited, we took like a U-Haul truck, went to the port, stuffed the car with like 10 scooters. By U-Haul truck, you mean a car to go? A car to go, yeah. <laughs> oh, we, we, we hadn't thought it through anyway, long story. Yeah. Um, and we got home, we had like beer and pizza to celebrate, and then we started opening the scooters one by one, and every single one had an issue. One would not turn on, the tire was smashed, the controller was broken, and we were like, okay, so we just lost basically, what, like two or three grand spending this and trusting people in fake Xiaomi copies. Oh boy. Um, but we learned a valuable lesson. We had one real scooter in there, which was a real Xiaomi, mm -hmm. and the quality was fantastic. We were like, okay, so never again, we're, like, <laughs> we're not, never going to trust people on Alibaba. And so just make sure to go to the official, uh, official ones. Wow. Yeah, it was, it was pretty tough at the beginning, especially those, uh, those early days when, like, again, we had no technical knowledge. You know, we are, I think, below average when it comes to technical competency. <laughs> um, and, you know, those, those first couple of shipments, uh, what wasn't there either. So we, we opened scooters and they just wouldn't turn on. And that was really the extent of our diagnosis. Um, <laughs> so before you know it, we're stuck with five scooters instead of ten. And, um, and somehow we, we managed to we sell, sell them. All of them. Still, yeah. Did you guys have sales background then? Like you guys said you met in school, but but what was your background there for no. education? Um, I mean, we went to like a pretty standard business school. Nothing, nothing like specific to sales, I would say. Just naturals then. Uh, <laughs> honestly, when you're desperate to get rid of uh, the thing that you put your savings into, I, I think the motivation just comes naturally. Mm -hmm. um, so, so that kind of plus, like I said, you know, the demand was insane. We didn't really have to try very hard to sell, and that's mm -hmm. still to some extent true to this day. Like we. We just focus on, on having the right product with the right features and, and strongly believe that with a little bit of advertising, the, the sales will come. Mm -hmm. And that has been true so far. Yeah. Wow. 
It's very impressive. And uh, why, why scooters specifically? Maybe not like other uh, electric vehicles. Yeah, um, I mean, we went to we, like we literally we were, we were roommates, and we both like went to Europe back on holiday for Christmas break. Um, and when we got back, there was these lime and bird had just started taking off. So that's why we started looking for scooters, and nobody you couldn't buy them anywhere. So we didn't even think about electric skateboards or, or anything of the sort. Mm -hmm. And that's it. We put you know ads up one night, and the next day we had fifty messages. So we're like, okay, there's a huge demand. There's no supply. And, and honestly, we never really look back. Like, you look at that bike market today, it's quite saturated, electric bikes, electric mm -hmm. skateboards, a little bit more of a niche. Um, so scooters, we saw as up and coming, and we, yeah, we didn't really think much yeah. more. I mean, scooters are still far from being mainstream today, but imagine mm -hmm. two, three years ago, they were they were literally just, like, emerging as a, as a mode of transportation, really. Yeah. Like, that was, that was just becoming a thing. Maybe France was really the only established market at the time. There were a couple of cities, like, in California, where Lyme and Bird were doing well. But really, that was that was kind of it. And every single person we met was like, "Hey, I was in Spain. I was in France. I was in California. I saw these scooters. Do you guys have any?" That was that was the customer base we started off serving, and and it grew from there. Wow. Uh, to be fair, as well, we did order like electric bike samples and like mm -hmm. these mopeds just to test it out. <laughs> um, so ha again, half of the bikes that came were broken, mm -hmm. so that really put us off. It was like, okay, we're gonna have to restart from the whole process again and buy fake and. Then, it was just like, it takes a lot of time and resources to sort of get the right product. Um, and yeah, and that's, so we, we just got turned off of that. And uh, hmm. it's, a, it's a very competitive industry too, um, especially on the bike, in the bike category. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a more mature category, right? It's been around for much longer. Um, I think it's also a much easier lead for a lot of customers because everyone is used to biking. Um, so then switching to electric biking or assisted um, kind of electric uh, bicycles, it's, it's a much easier uh, kind of jump to make mm -hmm. versus convincing someone to stand on what effectively is a skateboard with a pole, <laughs> right? Um, that's a bit more difficult. Um, and, and then that's why we think it's going to take a little bit longer for scooters to go mainstream, but we're getting there. So. And our first customer was like 70, <clears throat> 75 years old, yeah. something ridiculous. So that, that was, that was a waking up like a waking point for us in a way. It's like, okay, this product is super transversal. Anybody can drive it without any experience. A skateboard, like you ride on it, if you hit one pothole, you're gone, right? So it's like mm -hmm. it's super scary and a bit niche. Um, and also, when we saw scooters, like it was logistically quite easier for an e-commerce company to send scooters. These like mopeds would come in huge yeah. boxes, and we didn't have the capital to invest in warehousing and spacing and everything yet. So we just yeah stuck to scooters. I uh, remember when we when we saw the one moped sample we had at the time, and then loading that one up with a truck. Yeah, basically, imagine Cat of the Post pulling up a truck in front of your building. The moped that is probably the size of this table is sitting in your garage, and you somehow have to get it onto the truck. We don't even want to think about what happens after that, how they get it off yeah. the truck and what they do. But um, yeah, it basically took all three of us to lift it up and and push it onto the truck, and that's when we decided it was not worth the effort. So wow, wow. This is you guys' uh, first business, right? Yeah. yeah. First successful business. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, again, when, you, when we were in L'Oreal, I was like, you had all these different ideas. And that's one of the biggest landings is that everybody wants to sort of start a business and you can do as much research and everything. But if you can't make money straight out of day one, then it gets very tough. Mm -hmm. So like, we had these ideas of like food kitchens that would, you know, create tailored-made ta tailored food for you based on your needs. We had like postal cards where you can get someone to write a handwritten postal card and send it to someone else. But never really took off. And mm -hmm. then with scooters, it was a trick. Since day one, people were pre-ordering a scooter that was coming in, you know, 45 to 60 days. And when you have uh, that much demand and people willing to put the capital towards it, okay, that's, this is a business that can actually grow. Well, yeah, I think the difference is that one is a product business one. The previous ones were kind of a service for software that's, business. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and until you have service or software offering that's developed enough to be sold, you can't monetize it. And we just never got to the point where it was ready to be sold. Um, so with scooters, it was just much easier. You know, you don't really have to have a brand, website, reputation. Frankly, much of customer service and technical support either. As long as you just have the product, there's always demand for, you know, even used TVs, right? For all you know, you can just buy a TV off of someone uh, at a good price and try and resell it for a profit. That's essentially the business model that we operated on and, and continue to operate on this day mm -hmm. um, with a little bit of refinement, but with software and and service, you know, you're trying to crack a new business model and that's that's the stage we never, we never got to. Wow. Yeah. So it was a very obvious need in the market that was quite easy to fill then. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So how, how was the transition then from you guys all deciding to leave your day jobs and commit to Apollo fully? How, what was that conversation like and what did your uh, maybe significant others think of that too? Um, yeah, I'm trying to remember. <laughs> it's so long ago I now. Mean, they saw, honestly, my significant other um, and, and matches our, our, our best friends. Um, they saw how excited we were. We were literally so excited with scooters and it was just, 
you know, we work in L'Oreal, but then again, like we're working in cosmetics and it's just, it's not the product that we believe in necessarily. Scooters was so much fun. Mm -hmm. um, and it was just, it was a product that brought us so much joy. Like we would, you know, work in the morning before L'Oreal and after L'Oreal, we would keep working. We would go into L'Oreal content studios, sometimes <laughs> film stuff on scooters and like, we love it so much. And they let so you do much. that. Huh? And they let you, they never knew. But anyway, <laughs> we didn't do anything, anything bad, but, um, Essentially, it was so exciting and it was a big risk, but we were like 23, 24 years old. So like, worst case, what happens is that it doesn't work and you just go back to L'Oreal. Um, that, that was the worst part, like another big company. So again, there's, when something really, really excites you, it's just, mm -hmm. it's, it wasn't a question, yeah. So what was that turning point then? I think, I think the difference is that um, we never quit for something unknown. Mm -hmm. We had already reached a certain level of, I guess you could call it a side hustle at the time, right? Um, we were already making money, we had some shipments coming in, there was a basic process in place where we would have a website, list pre-orders, collect some funds, you know, deliver products, collect the balance. Um, we kind of had that going and the conversation wasn't really about do we take a leap of faith and go into this, you know, crazy adventure or or was it, it was more like do we think this is a scalable business and do we think we can grow it from like the $20,000 a month to something more substantial and, and we agreed that it was. So, so that's when we kind of said, okay, let's give it six months We'll, we'll invest our time in, into this thing for the next half year. And after six months, we're unable to scale it. We'll just say, okay, let's keep it as, as a side hustle and go back to corporate. But really, it was getting too much as well. Like we were doing both. Mm -hmm. And I remember at L'Oreal, you have two screens. And I had one like with a mirror display on it. And I was literally answering chats from customers while doing my work. And it was terrible. Oh I felt God. so bad to a certain extent. And it got too much. Like we were exhausted. So we're like, let's just go flat out in something that you, you know, really brings so much joy to you. And again, mm -hmm. see if we take the risk and, uh, and yeah. And then how did we convince you, Well, <laughs> <laughs> For me, I think I need to give a bit of a background, like uh, to give you a better idea. I was working as a mechanic before at Diesel, like a big truck mechanic. Funny enough, it's just across the street. <laughs> Shout out to Group D. But, um, I was working there, and uh, as you can imagine, it was extremely dirty. Uh, repairing Diesel truck, it's, uh, you cannot imagine after a day of work like, how dirty you are. Uh, and it's uh, quite opposite of the electric vehicle. Uh, but I was working there and I, had, I realized that I wanted to do something else with my life. Uh, and at the time I thought that I, I liked finance. So I went back to school for a year, a small course in like finance. And after that, I joined a furniture company called Bruy Martineau. And I worked there as an accountant. And uh, I also realized that I hated that. Like, uh, <laughs> completely hated it. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not made for a regular office job. Um, so I decided to go to the warehouse of that furniture store because I said to myself, if I am in a shitty uh, job, a bad job, uh, maybe I'll be more compelled to do something else. And at the time I was doing electric skateboard as well. I was like, maybe it's going to help me focus more on electric skateboard instead of being stuck in an office. And I was looking at my coworker that have been there for like 30 years. I'm like, man, I don't want to end up like this. It's so easy to to just go into the pattern of company and just like, this is your life now and that's it. I was like, I cannot do that. So that's why I went to the warehouse job. And uh, I remember in December around Christmas, I said to uh, my girlfriend, uh, Laurence, shout out as well. <laughs> I said to her like, I don't know what I'm doing with my life. Like imagine next year we have the same conversation uh, next Christmas and like I'm doing my dream job, like how awesome would I be? And uh, yeah, six months later, I met Chris and Mac on the circuit and uh, I knew then I was like, I'm already doing electric skateboard. Like I was finishing at midnight every night, you know, like just trying to, it was all custom, nothing was uh, pre-made. Yeah. So I was 3D printing the enclosure for the battery, for the, for the controller. I was buying the board myself, uh, really a lot of job for a small payout, but I was just passionate. And I, when you're passionate, you don't count the hours you put on it. So when mm -hmm. the guy offered me like a more stable job, or at mm -hmm. least like more work towards electric scooter. I was like, yeah, for sure, I'm gonna jump into it. And uh, my girlfriend was like, yeah, that's it's not even a question. You should do it, uh, mm -hmm. and it's gonna pay off. And it did. Nice. So it's kind of a similar story for you then as well. The electric skateboards were like a side hustle. Exactly. You just really loved, and I think you got, all exactly. got lucky meeting each yeah. other. But we we definitely I think I think we got more lucky than you did in a sense because <laughs> the, the I guess talent pool for you know uh, people that have a technical understanding of electric scooters or electric anything frankly in that micro mobility space is, is small is is an you know exaggeration of the <laughs> pool of candidates. So just the fact that we bumped into you on uh, the Formula One circuit 
And I mean, aside from your technical knowledge, the fact that like you obviously became one of the, the founding people of the company is just incredible, you know? So um, yeah, I guess it was just to some extent luck. Um, and Serendipity. Hard work. Yeah. <laughs> I think I should tell my side of the story for that day when I met them. <laughs> I was, uh, it was a group, right, at uh, Gilles Villeneuve circuit, an F1 circuit. And um, we're all there at like eight in the morning. Uh, and uh, we did uh, electric skateboarding around the, the circuit for maybe three hours. And I was waiting on someone that wanted to show me like his brand new electric skateboard. And I, it didn't come at the group ride. So I was waiting, waiting. I, I waited for him for one hour. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah. And after that, we, he came and we did some lap. And this is when uh, I saw Mac and Chris uh, on their scooter. And I just passed by them. And I'm not really a social person, but I was like, ah. Oh. <laughs> I have a feeling that I need to go back and talk to them. And uh, yeah, so there was a, a lot of things that uh, could have um, influenced the fact that I, mm -hmm. I couldn't have met them or so we were extremely lucky that day. Wow. Yeah. Crazy. Got to hang out out of the uh, F1 circuit world. <laughs> <Yeah. though. laughs> and that's crazy. Small world. We never, like when we started the company, we never thought, we never even thought about repairs and maintenance and things like that. And then as it started growing, it started like piling up and we're like, shit, like we need to, like, we need to find a solution for this. And it was literally perfect timing with uh, Adam so we were, yeah, really lucky. Wow. Yeah. So you guys all met and you started off in your apartments and then you made the decision to, to leave your, your day jobs. And, and what was the next step after that? How did, what was your guys' next step in growth? Yeah, I mean, you know, the biggest constraint we faced in the first year was just lack of inventory. And that's still true to some extent to this day. Um, you know, we, we didn't necessarily come from like a, an extremely well-funded background. Um, a lot of the company was just funded through our savings. And when we ran out of those, we asked our family for loans. And it was always just like friends and family that like we literally called up all of our friends <laughs> asking if they could kick in a couple of thousand bucks. And we promised to pay them back. Um, and did and you? We did. <laughs> my brother was shocked. He was yeah. like, I was expecting money to never come back to my yeah. So, so it, was, it, was, it was good motivation to make it work. Um, but again, because we were so early and the demand was so prevalent and there was just no supply, mm -hmm. we were able to turn that inventory pretty quickly. Um, and, uh, you know, our whole goal in the first year was just to get to a point where we have inventory and stock and we're able to fulfill it quickly. That mm -hmm. was really the priority and that's what, what fueled a lot of the growth. Because when you have no choice, it's better to have one scooter that is whatever, like s semi fitted for your needs, than mm -hmm. to wait four months and hope that you're gonna find something else. You know, so people ended up buying from us. Wow. But um, yeah, now we face slightly different challenges. <laughs> it's really a grassroots story on how you guys started. Yeah. And, uh, wow. and even the sales side, it wasn't, again, lots of people think like you're gonna open up a website and that's how it's gonna sell and, and things like that. Like we, we did the hustle and we like, we posted our ads everywhere on Facebook Marketplace, on QGG, like literally everywhere, like all these secondhand marketplaces. To one point, Match had a great idea, which was all the Lime scooters had come into the, to the city, and um, and we saw these people using it. And it was actually quite a, it actually boosted our demand, which was great. But even more than that, like he designed a sort of pamphlet that said, you you know, you're riding a Lime scooter and you're paying ten dollars mm -hmm. every thirty minutes. If you use this every day for a month, you've pretty much paid for half a scooter. Come, you know, Apollo scooters are come, best scooters, there's an and we stuck it on all the Lime scooters on the street. Wow. And, pamphlets. and and it did work. Like it was yeah, little ways cool. that we wouldn't just sit there and be like, okay, we're not getting any sales. We were literally like running everywhere to try and find ways. Yeah. We Guerrilla marketing, like, essentially. Yeah, pretty exactly. Like yeah. grassroots and just, yeah, so it's fun. Yeah. I mean, like at one point, a lot we were posting so many ads on Facebook Market. Like we all got banned multiple times. <laughs> um, but a lot even like found this way to like pre-fill certain fields on different websites to make it faster because we were posting uh, probably twice a day or or maybe once a day on average across Facebook Marketplace, KGG, and Craigslist times six cities. So we would post a specific ad for Vancouver, a specific ad for Calgary, you know, Toronto, Montreal, whatever. And um, so before you know it, it kind of adds up to a substantial amount of work. Um, but that is honestly where we got our initial few sales from and we, we just never stopped. Wow. Yeah. And you guys got enough revenue coming in and uh, sold enough scooters and eventually you upgraded to an actual warehouse and uh, office location. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the office office was just, uh, I guess, a stroke of luck. We actually worked out of the warehouse for the first, what, six months, maybe, mm -hmm. maybe a bit longer. Oof. So, yeah, I mean, just to paint the picture, the warehouse is kind of a long, they call them fingers for some reason. It, it's shaped like a finger, I guess. It's very long and very narrow. And it has no windows, it has no air circulation or ventilation, and it's got a shit ton of dust in there. So I'm pretty sure we all lost <laughs> Among other things. of our lives. Yeah, exactly. 
in the six months we worked there for. So, um, you know, but again, as Chris explained at the very beginning, we, we operate on the assumption that only when our needs exceed what we currently have, that's when we invest in additional resources, mm -hmm. not the opposite way around. And um, yeah, in the beginning, we moved into the warehouse, you know, and we filled, what, one third of it with our inventory. Mm -hmm. And like, that was pretty, that was the, all the space we took up. Um, and it wasn't until we couldn't stand it anymore and, and our health deteriorated dramatically. <laughs> That we for our own office. Plus, it's kind of difficult to hire people if you have to convince them to work in a warehouse. So, I'm, I'm glad I joined when I did. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. So, what's been the, the biggest surprise, I guess, so far in starting this company? Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> if you can pick just one. There's lots of surprises. Yeah. I mean, opening up to the US market was one of the biggest ones, I think. Um, because again, we were only using you know we were only targeting Canada, which is what the thirty five million people, mm -hmm. um, and we never actually looked into how we could get into the US because every time we tried calling with Alwa, um, it would they would always say like there's blockages and whatever, and we we actually found a way to do it. Mm -hmm. Um, it wasn't very hard at all. I don't know why it took us so long, but uh, anyway, and you have access to a pool of three hundred and fifty million people, um, so you have just a huge um, pool of, of people looking for electric scooters. Um, that was probably one of the biggest surprises. And the second is how underdeveloped the scooter market was. Mm -hmm. It's so new. There's no companies innovating into it. Like it was just an untapped niche. Um, and it, it had so much potential and we were early in the game. So like, if we don't do this flat out right now, we're going to lose out to someone with much more money or much more innovation mm -hmm. and we're done. So we took that very quickly. Yeah. And that fear still persists to this day. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Uh, and what's been like the, maybe the proudest moment or your, your favorite memory so far? I would say like more on the subject of surprise slash something that makes me proud is that you can run an outdoor uh, vehicle company out of a city that's frozen for half a year. <laughs> um, no, for real though, but Montreal, you know, it's, it's uh, in every way imag imaginable. It's a terrible place to start a scooter company. It's, it's you know, the climate is not conducive to that. Um, the, well, frankly, scooters are illegal in Montreal. So not exactly, uh, you know, a big kind of thriving local market. And um most of the business we, we serve now is, is coming from places like New York and California, both of which have their own scooter companies. So it's not like there wasn't competition globally, or at least in North America before, but we still somehow managed to carve out a bit of share, um, even though those guys were much better positioned to, to grow. And I really attribute that to the fact that we just outsmarted them, out outworked them, and you know, out hustled them, I guess, to some extent. Wow. Um, because we're, we're young, we don't have families, we don't have, we don't have kids, we just... We're here to, to grow this company, and, and that's the priority for everyone. Mm -hmm. And for reference, there's currently two feet of snow outside, and it's minus 15 Celsius. So uh, if anyone's not familiar with Montreal and its winters, <laughs> this is what we're dealing with. <laughs> I'll never forget the conversation with my, my dad, who's an like accountant who's been in, a, like in accounting and grown up the ladder for the last 30 years, being like, uh, yeah, I'm actually going to quit L'Oreal, which is a very stable, great job, to run an electric scooter company where it's minus 30 outside with two feet of snow. And it was, it's hilarious. But... Mm -hmm. I guess we didn't touch too much on like your, your personal backgrounds too. Like, where you guys are not from Montreal, right? Where you are, I am, yeah. <laughs> no, yeah. So I'm I'm born and raised in Mauritius. So it's a little island off of Madagascar in South Africa. Um, you know, beautiful, thirty degrees all year long. And you came um, to Montreal. And I came to Montreal. <laughs> no, because yeah, Mauritius is fantastic, and it, it you know it's a life, uh, the best life you could have as a kid. But for opportunities wise, and like actually doing something bigger, the, the, the education is quite limited. Mm -hmm. So I, I left at 18 and I went to, to UBC uh, to study business. And it was just, coming to Canada was one of the best things ever because you have so many opportunities. Like the university we had always had great programs, great internships. Like I went to Ethiopia, I went to Singapore, uh, I went to France on exchange. Like I did all this stuff. And then straight after university, when I graduated, I came to, to L'Oreal. Um, but yeah, very fortunate. So I've been able to do that as well. And, and for those who are curious, you're from Mauritius, but have a British accent? My mum's my mom's British. So <laughs> okay. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah. In case so anyone was not aware. I think you on Apollo's. Because yeah. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> I know I was confused when I first uh, spoke to you as well. <laughs> I know, I know. That's me. Yeah. Um, I was born in Poland. I uh, grew up there for most of my life. And then we moved to Amsterdam in, in the Netherlands for a couple of years. I uh, went to high school in Moscow after that for two years as well. And just like Chris... Ended up coming to UBC when I was 18, uh, also for business. We both ended up specializing in marketing. So 
really, again, quite, quite standard in terms of education, but uh, what was really nice about it is really just the fact that you meet so many different people and you know, before you know it, you have friends who are in engineering and friends who are in arts and friends who are in other disciplines. And I think that was really the biggest value of coming to Canada, a place that's so diverse, so mm -hmm. um, you know, multicultural. I feel like Mauritius is a bit more diverse than, than Poland, a country that's pretty much just everyone is a copy and paste of each other. So um, <laughs> yeah, for me, that was a bit, a bit of a, of a growing kind of chapter in my life and, and I'm, I'm really grateful for it. So, wow. yeah. And for those who don't know how to pronounce his name, it's Matchek, but <laughs> we all call him Mac. For oh, Matchek, make, make it easier. <laughs> and Allah, you're a... Uh... Yeah, I grew up uh, here in Laval, next to Montreal. It's about, uh, no. yeah, shout out to Laval. It's about two degrees uh, colder than Montreal. It's on the North Shore. Uh, and yeah, I went, like I said, to uh, the mechanic school, and I work in mechanics. So that gave me the basic skill to like uh, do soldering or knowing everything about the batteries. And um, for uh, the knowledge about the electric skateboard and uh, the electric scooter, it all came from a uh, forum and watching video on YouTube and just trying and... Uh, Breaking scooters. Really. <laughs> yeah. been, uh, trial and error. It's a lot of exactly. trial and error. Wow. That actually prompts a really, uh, really good little story. When we got one of those moped things mm -hmm. um, that we mentioned before as, a, as an experiment. And I don't even know how it broke. I, it somehow broke right at the very beginning when we got it. It was No, no, it wasn't broken. It was, it was limited in speed to oh, 25 was, kilometers yeah. an hour. <laughs> and Ella was like, oh, it's just a speed limiter in the controller. Um, all we have to do is remove that small speed limiter. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, oh, well, we will never forget this story. <laughs> it's embarrassing as it is. Yeah. Anyway, so that moped has been, you know, had sat in our house for like six months. And every single day we came in, we walked past it and we're like, oh, well, like, if you ever have, you know, a couple free minutes, maybe now's the time to, to get back at it and fix it. Because uh, it was like a chunky kind of Harley Davidson style moped that was electric and I mean, it looked really fun. So one day Alwa got to work and he, um, you know, he spent a few hours fixing it and then he brings it over to our desks, which were at the time in the warehouse. And he's like, hey guys, like, oh, I finally did it. Like, <laughs> he had a smile on his face. Was like, <laughs> and um, yeah, we get to this point where we're like, okay, speed, let's see, let's see how it works. And Alwa goes, okay, watch this. And he presses the accelerator and the moment goes backwards. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I don't know what the issue was. I guess the motor was just yeah, wrong direction. motor phase wire. Yeah. <laughs> that's um, yeah, that's been that's one of the highlights of <laughs> good learning experience, I guess. Um, yeah, but that's yeah. it. And even another story as well, like on, on the broken scooter side of it. Um, when we got that shipment of the first ten scooters that were all copies and broken and just terrible, um, me and Match actually were like, you know, we, we got one return from a customer and it was completely useless. So we're like, you know what, fuck it, let's just bring it to a. They have these rage cages in Montreal. Where oh you yeah, can yeah. Just bring it there yeah. and like we brought a scooter and we just <laughs> destroyed it. We took like axes and hammers and like just broke well, the scooter completely. I think, I think the irony of the whole video was that we wanted to show how like like we wanted this to be like a, a go viral kind of video where like here's how you know like a stress test for a scooter like we destroyed a scooter so we know what it takes to break them like yeah. we're Apollo we like stand behind the products anyway like that kind of stuff. <laughs> um, but then the scooter actually ended up being really difficult to break. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we ended up kind of just bringing it back home with a bit of like the plastic yeah. elements smashed, but everything else was more or less intact. So it kind of backfired. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and that's not how we test scooters anymore, no, is no, it? No, 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 no. <laughs> now we just press the horn button to see if it works. And that's <laughs> just kidding. Yeah. Wow. Any other like uh, horror stories like that uh, from your early days? Oh, man. Maybe uh, any customers, early customers that stand out? Well, customers... We either, either good or bad, maybe. Yeah, I'm just trying to think about where to start. <laughs> I mean, we're lucky on the good good, side, good customer side. Like, we were mm -hmm. very lucky because early innovators in the electric scooter markets are normally people who are... Like, we met some incredible customers. And, and mm -hmm. today, they're still, like, advisors or, like, they give us advice. And, like, we have a call on one next week. Like, Genuinely amazing people, and like I remember, there was one guy who who called us on a Saturday, Sunday morning, um, and he was like, "Can I test drive a scooter?" And I was like, "Yeah, hell yeah, of course." Um, so I, he came over, tested, and he was like, "I can't believe you're working on a Sunday," um, and he's like, "I love what you guys are doing, or whatever." And he's followed us for the last year and a half, um, and again, these these customers really shout stay. out to him. Yeah, his name <laughs> is Spiros. Yeah, he's, he's amazing, um, and it's again, it's like people like that who really just want to help small companies, whether it's just advice or thing, and that's that's the biggest learning. It's like always be nice to every single customer because. You don't know what they can add in terms of value, um, mm -hmm. and yeah, it's been a great, uh, great resource. So it's we're very grateful for that. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, I guess maybe finally, what what are you guys' goals for the future, and where do you see the company going? That's a great question, and something we've been thinking about quite a lot lately. Um, to give you a bit more context, um, I think it's important to understand what's happening 
with us internally right now and what's mm-hmm. happening to the category or the industry as a whole and how these two come together to inform what, what we will do in the future. So what's happening with us internally is we, we've managed to build up a team. You know, we have a, we have an awesome team of people. Um, you know, we're expanding pretty rapidly and, and it Thank finally you. feels like, <laughs> or shout out, um, it finally feels like we are getting to a place where things are rolling and we can actually start to think less about maintenance and operations and more about the next steps. Mm-hmm. Um, so we're, we're in a comfortable position uh, as a business. Um, however, what's interesting is that the industry is getting a lot more competitive. So we're seeing a number of new entrants, a number of new dealers. We're seeing repair centers popping up left and right. So things are getting interesting. You know, the industry is mm-hmm. growing and scooters are this, this, clo- this much closer to going mainstream, which is, which is awesome for everyone. Um, and we always invite competition because, you know, it pushes us to be better and um, we hope we do the same to our competitors. Mm-hmm. Um, so how, how this pertains to our future is uh, we believe that the future is, um, is a hybrid of hardware and software. So we're essentially in the middle of a transition from a hardware company to a software company right now, where we're making strides to uh, really understanding what the needs are of the future rider. You know, how can we build a scooter that won't be appealing to those maniacs that want to go 60, 70, <laughs> 80, you know, 100 kilometers an hour, um, but really something that can, that can convert a non-scooter customer to a scooter customer and we believe that the way to convert those people is through awesome features that can only be delivered by software so we really envision uh, the future as as a beautiful hybrid of, of incredible hardware that just works and it doesn't break and it's reliable mm-hmm. and if it does break we have we have a phenomenal framework that can help customers get it back to the to the place where it should be mm-hmm. and then the second half of it is software that just really enables the hardware to shine um, so I, I can't give too many details away, um, you know, with regards to the specific features we're working on and, and how that's going to relate to the product lineup that we're working on for 2022. But I think within a year to maybe 18 months, we're going to be a very different company than we are today mm-hmm. um, with a much greater focus on, on software. And you guys really want to, like, innovate, too. Sorry to cut you off, Chris. But you like want to – something the industry is lacking, I think you guys have mentioned before, right? That kind of innovation mm-hmm. and unique products. Sure. Yeah, I mean, like our, our bet is that um, ultimately, you know, if you look at a Samsung phone and an iPhone, the hardware is very comparable in terms of the, the processing power, the memory, and, and I mean, there's not a huge difference between the two phones. Mm-hmm. And yet one, arguably, you know, the iPhone has a much better user experience because of the software that is just so beautifully integrated with the hardware. And that's, that's where we see us heading towards as well. That's, that's, that's the plan. So, uh, yeah, and that's like the focus on, I'd say, the product and the software and uh, the hardware. Um, on the other side, it's just if you think take like a big step out and you say the electric scooters in general, like electric scooters are still super new mm-hmm. in terms of um, in Canada, for example, 75, pe- 75% of people in major cities still use cars for distances less than five kilometers, which is easily replaceable with an electric scooter, right? It's much more efficient. It's, uh, you know, it's cheaper and it's so much fun. It's like, mm-hmm. again, people still compare it to riding on like a magic carpet. So one of the big things that we have to work on is also education, like educating customers to say, you know, there's much more efficient, fun mm-hmm. ways to uh, of mobility coming, and it's it's a matter of time that it takes over a lot of the things. Like, yeah, in, in different countries, that they're replacing all middle streets in, in cities with bike lanes, and mm-hmm. that's where we need to be. On we need to really educate and, and shift consumer perspectives to that, um, and that's also like on on the wholesale side and distribution. Um, you know, we're present in countries like Mauritius, where they're turning all these cities into smart cities um, that allows you know people to to just use scooters because I have a car that's emitting gas. Um, so there's a lot of things like a lot of potential worldwide and there's so many scooters are still so new um, that we have you know a, a very focused job on the software and the hardware but it's also just developing this new technology to show people that there's more sustainable uh, ways of transportation that are that are just much more fun mm-hmm. um, in the world yeah exciting mm-hmm. yeah I guess this is really important why you don't necessarily want to be the first one into a new market you don't want to be that first pioneer it's very hard to to kind of break that ground but you want to be early enough people know about it but not know mm-hmm. too much about it yet and you like you want to give them a new product you want to be the best that's it and i think we're, we're kind of past the initial stages of market development right like the market's been validated and it's it's growing like it's it mm-hmm. is. that's just the, the truth that's the fact um so it's now it's a question of amongst the key players in those markets you know what do we need to do to become the best and the best is is a complicated place to be <laughs> because it means we need to have best products and that's Mm -hmm. what I was trying to to speak to you know with regards to having something that's truly compelling and and unique it's also having the best manufacturing practices being able to control our quality 
Um, especially, you know, it's easy when you make a 10 scooters a day, but uh, what about a thousand scooters a week, right? Like all of a sudden the scale is what becomes difficult to manage. And we need to work with our factory. We need to hire people on the ground that can go into these factories and, and really oversee a lot of these processes. And um, mm -hmm. I was also working on, you know, a testing facility here in Montreal that's going to be a separate check that we do internally. So we're basically going to stress test every new model in a very specific way. Um, to make sure it lives up to our standards of what safety should be like, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then like Chris mentioned, you know, you, you can have the most amazing product, but if you can get it to to a place where people can see it, try it and, and touch it and write it, then, you know, what good is it? Mm -hmm. And then all the way at the end, you know, there's also the custom support section, which is, which is very important as well, because inevitably scooters are expensive products. They are, you know, complicated products products that need support, uh, products that, need, you know, people require guidance to essentially figure out what they want, uh, which product is right for them, how do they repair a flat. Um, there's a lot of hand-holding that's involved in, and that's just the nature of the industry, and we also strive mm -hmm. to be the best in that department. So to be the best, you need to be exceptional at all of the above, and, and managing all of these departments or functions is, is the trick. So Sounds easier than it is. Yeah. <laughs> and again, I just want to like, distress the... The importance of customer service is like, and that's I think how we grew as well so quickly in the start. It was um, we've always been on like chats. We've always been on, like we've had every way to communicate with the company because lots of people want to buy electric scooters, but they have absolutely no idea what scooter they want. So they'll come and be mm -hmm. like, "Yeah, I'm this. You know, I need this for distance and, and things like that." And we must never sort of undervalue. But like Matchat, it's literally a combination of everything. If one falls, everything falls. Mm -hmm. So we're focusing on striving on the best customer service product and uh, and manufacturing as much as we can. Mm -hmm. And on the point of uh, innovating new products and, and trying to be a, I guess, pioneer in what we provide, I know we don't want to give away too many secrets, but are we able to talk maybe about some of the projects we're working on or uh, what plans well, you have? I guess it's really like, um, like you just said, we need to elevate um, the whole industry. And like, if you look at the motor right now, the brushless motor, they haven't really changed since Tesla invented them. And they are working great, but 90% of the motor break because of the same reason. It's a bad all sensor or just a controller. If we want to push the software, well, we need to implement more uh, sensor into the controller to give the data that we need. So we we need really to elevate all those players at the same time to be able to produce something uh, incredible. But uh, I don't want to reveal too much on the on the future model. Can you reveal totally, on the yeah. future? <laughs> Regen break. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, mechanical brakes are a thing of the past, and yeah. I mean the same way Tesla's break with. You know, the region breaks, there is no reason why scooters shouldn't. So mm -hmm. um, that's the direction. That's one of the key features we're, we're exploring. Mm -hmm. A lot of this is kind of above my head. But I guess we also just dropped a video the other day of uh, exactly. your, your project with the controller. And, and you're kind of wanting it to be a, a plug-and-play process, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, we, we already proved that the Ludo was, is working phenomenally. It's an incredible product. And the, and the mission now is really to bring this the, the region break and all the, the software with the app and everything to a mass uh, market uh, level uh, it's hard to produce it's hard to configure uh, everything can go wrong if you change just a little setting so we need to produce a controller limit the customer within certain value mm -hmm. and to make it sustainable for an electric scooter because we are working on higher voltage than electric skateboard that are the one usually using those controller so there's a, a few things we need to change to really make it uh, a great product we have our Model S, now we're building a Model 3. <laughs> <laughs> well, this has been great, guys. Uh, I think we've learned a lot, and it's been really cool to see the company grow. And I mean, I know, speaking from personal experience, when I was first interviewing with you guys, I could definitely see the ambition and the energy, and it was very attractive, and um, it's definitely something I wanted to be a part of. Before we end, was there anything else you guys wanted to share, touch on? A couple shout-outs, maybe. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> um, no? no? Thanks for organizing yeah. this, guys. Um, you guys can't see Randy behind the <laughs> camera. Um, so Sean, Randy, thank you guys very much for organizing this. I think we're one of the first scooter companies to venture into podcasts. So as far uh, as I know, yeah, yeah, really, really <laughs> curious to see how this how this does. And yeah, keep following Toasty, guys. There's going to be a lot of a lot of uh, big things in the next twelve months. And uh, and yeah, hopefully we can share as much as we can through these podcasts because it's much it's much more fun seeing the growth and like the back end of a co of a company because mm -hmm. lots of people take it for granted of like oh it's a big company and they haven't suffered or whatever and, like. When you see the the step by step and, and everything that's gone through, it makes you realize you can do any of this easily as well. Um, it just requires hard work and a great team. Wise motivational words. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you guys. Thank this will wrap up, guys. and uh, everyone ride safe. Sounds good. Thank you.